Welcome to lecture 2.4, Cayley's Theorem. In this series of lectures, we just finished introducing five families of groups, cyclic, abelian, dihedral, symmetric, and alternating groups. In this lecture, we will introduce Cayley's Theorem, which says that every finite group is isomorphic to a collection of permutations. Any set of permutations that forms a group is called a permutation group. Now it doesn't have to be a set of all permutations, that's the symmetric group, and all of the even permutations is the alternating group. It could just be some collection, some subset of permutations that forms a group on its own. That's a permutation group. Cayley's theorem says that permutations can be used to construct any finite group. In other words, every group has the same structure as, the fancy word is, is isomorphic to some permutation group. And we will study later what it means to be isomorphic to. That's a, that's a big topic later on. Warning, we are not saying that every group is isomorphic to some symmetric group Sn. That's not at all what we're saying, because we've seen groups like D8 that have size 8, and 8 is not n factorial for any n. Rather, every group is isomorphic to a subgroup of some symmetric group, i.e. a subset of Sn that is also a group in its own right. Now the topic of subgroups is something that we're going to study very shortly. Here's a question for you. Given a group, how do we associate it with a set of permutations? Well, I'm going to show you two ways. One using the Cayley diagram and another using the multiplication table. Here's the first algorithm which uses the Cayley diagram. And let's suppose that the Cayley diagram has n nodes or n vertices. First step is to number the nodes 1 up to n. Doesn't matter which node gets which number. And then interpret each arrow type in the Cayley diagram as a permutation. And the resulting permutations are the generators of the corresponding permutation group. Let's do an example. So here's D3, and we numbered the nodes 1 up to 6 arbitrarily. And now let's look at the two types of arrows. Let's start with the red arrow. So the red arrow takes 1 to 3, 3 to 2, and 2 to 1. So 1 to 3, 3 to 2, 2 to 1. And... 4 to 5, 5 to 6, 6 to 4. So 4 goes to 5, goes to 6, goes to 4. That's a permutation, and that's corresponding to the generator R. Next, let's look at F, the other generator. F sends 1 to 4, to, or it's, it's a product of transpositions, 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6. So that's 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6. In cycle notation, of course, this is this one is 1, 3, 2, 4, 5, 6. And this one is 1, 4, 2, 5, and 3, 6. So now we have the generators of the group. So this, this is going to generate a group of order 6, which is a subgroup, meaning it sits inside S6, which has order S6 is a group that has order 6 factorial, and I think that's equal to 720. So inside of there is this group of order 6. And actually inside of here, S6, is a whole bunch of groups like this of order 6. As you can imagine, as we, um, this labeling 1 up to 6 was pretty arbitrary. If I had labeled this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I would get a completely different group of order 6 that sits inside of S6. So there's going to be a whole bunch of these guys inside of, inside of S6. Not necessarily n factorial because some of the labelings are going to give you the same group, but there's going to be a lot of them. Now I will not actually write out the other four elements. I'll leave that as an exercise if you want to. Now you, you, you can ask what is R squared in permutation notation? What is um, what else is there? There's, what is RF? What is R squared F? And I, I think I'm missing, um, oh, and of course there's the identity, which is going to be the identity permutation. So 
I encourage you to pause the lecture and take a minute or two, just for practice, and write out these three elements in cycle notation using the generators R and F. Next, here is an algorithm given a multiplication table with n elements. First, replace the table headings, which are normally group elements, with 1 up to n. Might as well make them in increasing order. Next, go through the rest of the table and make the appropriate replacements, replacing elements with the corresponding numbers. And now, interpret each column as a permutation. This results in a one-to-one -one correspondence between the original group elements, not just the generators, and permutations. Let's do an example. Here is the multiplication table of V4. So before the replacements, I guess this, this was E, V, H, and V, H. So E, V, H, and V, H. So what we did is we took V, I've colored that red to denote that we're replacing V with 2 and H, which is blue, with 3. So now E, V, H, V, H becomes 1, 2, 3, 4. And then we replace the corresponding entries inside the table with the numbers as well. So all of these red squares that have a 2 in it were V. All of these things were H, and these were V, H. And now, interpret each column as a permutation. So what do I mean by that? So this first column is the permutation that sends 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3, 4 to 4. That's the identity permutation. Column 2 is the permutation that sends 1, 2, 3, 4 to 2, 1, 4, 3, meaning 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1. So 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1. Uh, 3 goes to 4, 4 goes to 3. 3 goes to 4, 4 goes to 3. See how this is going? Let's do the next table. 1, or the next column, right here. 1 goes to 3, and 3 goes to 1. So 1 and 3 are swapped. 2 goes to 4, 4 goes to 2. So 2 and 4 are swapped. And finally, the last one. 1 goes to 4, 4 goes to 1 right here, and 2 goes to 3, and 3 goes to 2. That's right here. So V4 is isomorphic to this subgroup of S4. So the subgroup generated by, well, there's three permutations. We can pick any two of them because we know any two of these three elements generate V4. But let's stick with our original generators, V and H. So this is the subgroup. So th this is a subgroup inside of S4 that is isomorphic to V4. It's generated by these two permutations. Now, of course, we could have done, you know, we, uh, we could have labeled these differently. We could have swapped the, instead of 1 up to 4, we could have done 1, 2, 3, 4, and we could have gotten, like the previous example, we could have gotten another subgroup of order 4 that sits inside of S4. Now, not every permutation is going to give us a distinct subgroup. Sometimes we double up, and different orderings will give us different subgroups. But there will be a number, or there's at least a handful of distinct subgroups inside of S4 that are isomorphic to V4 via this construction. Finally, we can get to Cayley's theorem. Intuitively, two groups are isomorphic if they have the same structure. We're going to study this later, and we're going to see different ways to verify that groups are isomorphic. One way that's a guarantee is if we can construct Cayley diagrams for two groups that look identical. In that case, that's a certificate saying, yes, these groups are isomorphic. Remember, the converse is not true. Just because we have two Cayley diagrams on the same number of nodes that look different doesn't necessarily mean that the groups are actually not secretly isomorphic. Cayley's theorem says that every finite group is isomorphic to a collection of permutations. Our algorithms exhibit a one-to-one -one correspondence between group elements and permutations. So we, I've showed you how to do this constructively. However, we have not shown technically that the corresponding permutations actually form a group. 
or that the resulting permutation group actually has the same structure as the, as the original. It should be pretty darn obvious that it does, though. What needs to be shown, technically, is that the permutation from the i-th row followed by the permutation from the j-th column results in the permutation corresponding to the cell in the i-th row and j-th column of the original table. Now, I'm not going to go into details as to why this has to be shown, but if you wait until my lecture on homomorphisms and isomorphisms, I think you'll understand if you return to this as to why that is the, the, the crucial condition. But if you do want to see why that is true, now it, sh it should be clear if you think about it why that is true if you wrap your head around it. But otherwise, I'll refer you to page 85 of the textbook Visual Groove Theory for an actual formal proof.